What does Israel's new government mean for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? What is the future of the Abraham Accords? What is the impact of Russian and Ukrainian war on Israel and Palestine? I'm Yad Nahavali, and this is Middle East Analytics. Debbie, thank you very much for joining the program. Thanks to you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we know that Israel has experienced one of the biggest protests in its history. Uh, can you please tell us what's going on in Israel at the moment? Yeah, yeah. well, Israel indeed is experiencing one of its uh, moments with the most political instability in the recent history. That's for sure. But to understand that, we have to understand that Israel has gone through political instability for the last at least three years. In the last three three years, Israel has had at least five rounds of elections with an undecisive result every time. The main issue is the is the yes, Benjamin Netanyahu or no or no Benjamin Netanyahu that has really polarized the people. The the people of Israel is very divided on this issue, and this has resulted on five different rounds of election uh, of politicians fighting this this let's say this political war. Now, in the in the last uh, December, the the current government of Israel was formed. Uh, at the end of the day, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu managed to form a coalition uh, for for who doesn't know Israel works uh, in a parliamentary system. So meaning that to in order to be prime minister, uh, you, you have to have a coalition uh, with uh, at least 50 percent plus one persons in the Israeli Knesset, which is 120 people. So 61 is the amount required. So finally, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu managed to form a coalition this coalition has some let's say on um like uh, uh, some members that didn't have that much power before but now are a really important part of the coalition which is the far right now uh, they are promoting their interests because the coalition of prime minister benjamin netanyahu depends on their support so they can promote some of their interests now the biggest um, contro- controversy that this government has brought is the judicial reform. The right has claimed many times that the Supreme Court in Israel is a left inclined and it um, it doesn't let the parliament to act as it needs. Now, this is a really gray area because Israel doesn't really have a constitution. The closest thing to constitution that Israel has are a basic laws, but these basic laws can be easily altered by, by a majority in the parliament. So it is, so the Supreme Court can call can uh, revise a law saying that it's unconstitutional, but since we don't have a constitution in Israel, so this is a very gray area. Many Israelis do uh, agree on the fact that a judicial reform is needed, but the big controversy is the kind of of judicial reform that this government is advancing. Uh, this has brought it has, this has brought a series of twenty six consecutive massive weeks of mat- of massive protests in the street in the streets, which are nothing minor because in each of them. Every Saturday, at least 100,000 Israelis go out to the streets and protest. And in a, in a country that, it, that has less than 10 million citizens, well, 100,000 is, is, a, is a huge number. It's not minor. Um, a few months ago, the Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, called both the government and the opposition to the presidential house to have uh, negotiations to reach a, a wider a um, consensus on the judicial reform. The talks went on for a while, and uh, at the end of the day, the opposition left the talks because it claimed that the government was not really compromised with them. And since then, the government has continued to to legislate these laws that are related to the judicial reform. We have to understand that the judicial reform is a package of a lot of, of, of legislation, a lot of laws, and this is a really long process. So as it goes on, the the protests also grow. Uh, yesterday night, actually, uh, Israel uh, Tel Aviv say, um, 
head of the of the police of Tel Aviv, he resigned because um, he was asked by the national security minister, Tamar ben in Israel, he was asked to use greater force against uh, protesters because they were... Um, they were blocking some important roads in Tel Aviv. He refused to it, so he moved him to another job, which is kind of a, a thing of kind of a, a, a job that is diminished. So he um, he resigned, and this caused yesterday, uh, which is not Saturday, the, the usual day of pro- protests. It, this caused additional protests yesterday. So the 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 current. Um, environment is Israel in Israel the current political arena in Israel is really really unstable with a lot of unrest and a lot of things are going on we have to wait and see what's next right uh, you mentioned the right thing and extreme nature of the Israeli government at the moment um, and we know that it was a military operation going on in, in in the West Bank area so can you please tell us what does Israeli new government mean for Israel and Palestine conflict? Well, we have to notice that, first of all, the uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been in a status quo for a very long time. It's not uh, a matter of this government. Uh, the Palestinian government hasn't changed in a long time. It, uh, it has been the same since 2004, since Mahmoud Abbas came to power because they don't, uh, don't really have elections. But both governments have been really, uh, let's say, uh, static in their in their in their efforts to reach a peace agreement. Now, this government, uh, uh, but if we if we look at the status quo, it's not really status quo because violence is escalating in both sides. Um, so it's really important to deal with it. Um, and there is another problem, which is not only the ideology of the of the current Israeli government, and is that the Palestinian Authority currently doesn't have a lot of authority in the Palestinian arena. So in order to address any peace talks, first of all, both sides have, have to have a, a, a strong leadership that has authority and that can reach decisions and, and, and sit in a table with the other side. So that currently doesn't exist. This is a very complicated situation. The status quo is is probably uh, going to stay the same for a while uh, since uh, w- what we see in the situation in both sides. Um, and, the, and the operation in Jenin, it, it actually ended yesterday. Uh, the Israeli troops entered entered the, the city of Jenin, and this is exactly because the Palestinian Authority lost a lot of grasp in the area of Jenin, and the uh, terror organizations uh, such as the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and, and Hamas both uh, uh, just took over this territory and and made it the center a center to train terrorists to uh, to sorry to to save weapons in, in, for example, houses inside of civilian houses to to launch rockets towards Israel. So Israel had to go in and, uh, let's say, clean the, the, the terror infrastructure that has been built in Jenin for a long time because the Palestinian Authority uh, lost, completely lost its grasp on the area. Right. Um, okay, if we accept that Netanyahu realized that status quo offers Israel the most benefit at the lowest cost, and Israel receives uh, many of the advantages of peace without having to give up any land. So in light of this view, um, how we can predict the conflict in the future? Continuation of status quo and escalation, international efforts, or shift in public opinion and leadership? Well, this is a very complicated question. I wish I had the answer to I cannot predict the future in such a volatile area of of the world, which is the Middle East, and of the Middle East, which is this conflict, is very hard to to predict the future. Uh, what I can say is what I said uh, uh, before is that both sides currently are not really in the position to sit in a negotiations table and speak. Also, many of our sources at the media line have told us that uh, the Middle, uh, the United States, with 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 we, uh, who usually was uh, mediating this 
this kind of peace efforts is doesn't have a really strong grasp currently in the Middle East, which which is also an issue. So I cannot predict what the future holds for this conflict. Is um, it's something that I think now I guess no one can predict. Right. Uh, you also mentioned uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, given the rising pressure and uh, uncertainty uh, surrounding Mohammed Abbas uh, leadership with a significant majority of Palestinians um, expressing their desire for him to resign, um, what potential consequences this can have for the future peace nego negotiations and the stability for this region? I think if we if we try to predict the future of the conflict, the most important question is what will happen in the Palestinian arena the day after Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas has been in power uh, in the West Bank, uh, in the power of the Pal Palestinian Authority, for since 2004 when Yasser Arafat died. And since then, there has been no elections at all. Now, uh, Mahmoud Abbas have ha has had ups and downs in, in terms of Palestinian uh, public popularity, but now I think he's probably in the lowest point he has been ever. Uh, and other than that, he's already um, he's already been a lot of years in power and his uh, medical condition, let's say, is not the best. So one way or another, there will be soon a day with, uh, with, with, with no Mahmoud Abbas in the picture and that's the biggest question. Currently, because the lack of elections in a in the in the Palestinian Authority, there is no overwhelming leader that will be the next one. We don't know yet, and we don't even know which faction is it gonna be from. Uh, it is a very co it, but what we know is that when when Mahmoud Abbas is not uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority anymore, it will be a very complicated moment for the Palestinians and possibly a very bloody one. I'm saying that because we have seen this in the recent history of, of, of uh, the Palestinian ar arena. Whenever there's a vacuum of authority, all of the factions try to pop up and take control. For example, we saw that in 2005 when Israel retired from the Gaza Strip, it, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip, uh, there was a vacuum of authority, a vacuum of power. And immediately, almost immediately, a kind of a civil war be between uh, Fatah and Hamas erupted. And uh, with at the end of the day, with Hama Hamas victorious, who is the, the group that controls currently the Gaza Strip. So the West Bank is a much more complicated area. And um, it's very, hard, it's very hard, hard to know. But what I can tell you is that we have seen in the recent uh, elections in universities, which is a really big deal in the Palestinian arena, in the political Palestine, Palestinian arena, is that Hamas is getting a lot of support in the West Bank currently, is rising its support. But this is a problem both for Israel and for the United States, who and also the European Union, who... Uh, denominate Hamas as a terror organization, which makes it a real problem to communicate with them. Uh, today, Israel has a coordination with the Palestinian Authority, and if uh, Hamas will will ta take over control, uh, it will be a real problem. Problem because conflict or not conflict, communication between Israelis and Palestinian is crucial for the day to day life, and this is something that doesn't really appear in the news every day, but it's something that exists on a daily basis. So if Hamas say, grabs the, the, the control over, over the West Bank, it will be a huge problem for both Israel and the United States as well. Right. Um, now let's talk about the Abraham Accords. We know that uh, many of the countries which signed the Abraham Accords condemned the the recent uh, military operation in the in the West Bank, and also we know at the same time, China was trying to acting as a mediator between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We know that Iran is improving its relationship with Saudi Arabia and other Persian Gulf countries. So, in light of these developments, how you can predict the? Actually, most of my question questions are about predictions. Uh, but um, we need to know uh, what will happen with the Abraham Accords in the future. Well, the Abraham Accords have uh, that were signed in 2020 
have were probably the most important development in terms of Israeli Arab ties in the Middle East ever. The peace the the peace accords that happened before the Abraham Accords between Israel and an Arab state was in 1994 between Israel and Jordan. So in 2020, now four a uh, Arab states signed a a peace agreements with Israel, with that, which are the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. Now, all of these have been really working hard in building a prosperous future of, of the relations between Israel and each of these countries. This includes a, for the economic arena, a, which is really, really strong with all the high-tech exchange and all the business exchange. This includes also the military arena, which um, which has been also growing. And lastly, it includes the geopolitical arena where Israel is finally recognized as a member of the neighborhood by some uh, Arab countries that never did that before. Now, it's true that there has been condem condemnation, uh, especially since this government in Israel came to power in January this year, to the Israeli government and also for, for the operation in Jenin. I, but I do not think that would really affect the accords. Uh, this condemnation, condemnation is, first of all, someone something that these countries must do publicly because um, they are part of, of, of the Arab League and they are part of this community that um, supports uh, publicly uh, uh, the Palestinians. Uh, but I don't really think that this will change uh, in the ground the relations for, uh, and at least not the economic relations between Israel and, and these countries. Now, for the second part of the question, uh, we have interviewed a lot of people at the media line that have told us that America has apparently withdrawn from uh, the Middle East, giving a lot of room for China to bring to bring its presence and its influence in the Middle East, which this is not a consequence of the Abraham Accord, the the Saudi Arabia and the Iran agreement. That sorry, I forgot to say that I was talking about that. The second part of the question, the Saudi Arabia Iran agreement. I don't think is this is a consequence of the Abraham Accords countries say, condemning Israel some Israeli policies. But I think it's more a consequence, as, as many experts uh, have, have told us, of the uh, apparent American withdrawn from the region. Um, Saudi Arabia used to see America as a partner for its security, its national security. Even if they say it or not, many experts believe that Saudi Arabia's biggest threat, biggest existential threat, is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now that Saudi Arabia doesn't really see the United States as a partner that it would do everything for its own security, that it's a partner that, that it can trust, many people understand these agreements between Iran and Saudi Arabia as an effort of the Saudi kingdom to mitigate the risk of a future Iranian attack on its territories. And... But in terms of the Abraham Accords, there have been, for example, many rumors saying that Saudi Arabia may be the next country to sign a, an agreement with Israel. A, actually, the media line was at a briefing with a, Israel's foreign minister, Minister Eli Cohen, this week, who said that Israel is really working on the requirements that Saudi Arabia is asking for uh, in order to have an agreement, and that he hopes that uh, that an agreement will come soon. But we'll have to do to to see what happens. Many experts believe that a stronger American presence is needed uh, for a, an accord of 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 this say uh, of this importance to happen. So right. also it it depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, the right. success of the Iraq accords. Yeah, um, you mentioned United States of America. Now let's talk about that. We know that. Uh, Republicans have more favorable view of Israel's government, while Democrats probably uh, have less favorable view of, of the Israeli government. We know that the elections in the United States is coming up uh, next year. So again, how can we predict the future of relation between Israel and United States in light of the elections in November 2024? 
Well, um, first of all, we have to see what the results are, which are still unpredictable since we're really far from 2024. But what I can say is that recent recent polling ha- says that Israel is losing support in the American Congress, and that and Israel has is going to have to deal with that. Uh, but having said that, the ties between Israel and and the United States of America are uniquely strong and resilient. And we have seen that seen that through through history. So I don't really think that that the the results of the elections are really going to change the the nature of the ties. But if if President Biden gets another term, Israel will will, will most likely have to start to to listen more carefully to the or, or pay more attention to the anti-Israel voices in the American political arena. But it doesn't mean that if President Biden a, a gets another term, it, the the ties will deteriorate. I don't think that will happen. But uh, Israel still has to address and prevent the, the, the ties from damaging. And I guess also the, the people in the American political arena that are interested in having strong ties with Israel, they also need to try to continue to build them and to preserve the relations as they are. Right. Now let's talk about the war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, we know that Israel has a delicate position due to its relationship with both uh, Ukraine and Russia. Its alliance with the United States and security concerns in Syria, where Russia plays a critical role. Considering all of this, how will the war between Russia and Ukraine impact Israel and Palestine? Well, first of all, uh, this is a, a, a very complicated question because the Russo-Ukrainian war has really affected the whole globe in very in, in various uh, fields. So, first of all, I would like to address the economic field, which I, I I think it's very interesting. We know that the Russo-Ukrainian war uh, has, for example, halted the wheat ex- uh, exports of these two countries that were both of both were part of the top five uh, wheat exports exporters in the in the world. And the Middle East was the main customer of these exports. So the whole Middle Eastern region has stopped getting this wheat, which is most probably the one of the most basic uh, food products uh, in the in the market. And this has really raised the prices of wheat, which has led many countries in the region to to have a bigger percentages of poverty and the and the the, the life uh, uh, sorry the cost of life uh, has grown a lot for example in Egypt we can see this very strongly on the other hand economically the middle east also sees some sees some benefits why am i saying that because of the energy crisis that the russo ukrainian war has caused uh, because of the sanctions on russia Russia was the main supplier of energy to Europe. And because of the sanctions on Russia, this supply has stopped. And Europe is looking for a different alternative. Every European country is looking desperate for different alternatives of energy, either gas or oil. And the Middle East, which happens to be maybe the closest region to Europe, has a lot of these resources on their grounds. So uh, we have seen a lot of different agreements, which involve, for example, the north of Africa, Israel, all the eastern Mediterranean area, Lebanon, Lebanon and Israel. Recently, in this context, they signed the the maritime border agreement so that both countries can exploit the gas, the natural gas that you can find in their in their maritime territories. They have they signed this agreement so that they can get on to to start exploit exploring there. And this is a really good economic um, economic opportunity for many countries in the Middle East. For example, Lebanon is, has been described uh, by the World Bank as one one of the of the of the most severe economic crisis in the in the modern history. So this can be an opportunity to start developing and reconstructing their economy once again. So this is the the economic arena, which I, I I think it's really important. The other one is the geopolitical arena, which for Israel is very very complicated. 
On the one hand, as you said, Israel has a lot of th- uh, very good ties with Ukraine and, of course, with NATO, with all the NATO alliance. And uh, now that Ukraine, who is an ally of, of NATO, is, is, not part, is not part of NATO, but it's a strong ally of NATO, of NATO is being attacked, Israel, of course, uh, feels uh, the compromise to uh, aid Ukraine. On the other hand, Russia plays a really important role in what concerns Israel's national security. So Israel has to be very, very delicate in what it does in this in this context. For example, Russia, um, Iran has a land corridor uh, which it uses, for example, to transport armament and weapons to Hezbollah, to its proxy in, in Lebanon. And this includes, it comes out from Iran, then Iraq, then Syria, and that way it gets to Lebanon. Israel usually targets these weapons uh, when they are in Syria. And this, in one way, is alla- allowed by, by Russia. So Israel has to be really careful. Also, also Russia helps uh, for the for Israel to to keep the border, the, its its Syrian border quiet. So it is a really important thing for Israel. So what Israel does is what it can do without angering Russia, which is giving a lot of humanitarian aid to Ukraine and also a defensive uh, capabilities as well. Right. Um... As a last question, uh, if you can answer me in, in a short way, you mentioned Iran. We know that Iran is supporting different groups like Hamas and Hezbollah in their, in their fight against Israel. Um, we know also that Israel and Iran has uh, have many tensions around uh, Iran's nuclear program. So in your opinion, what's the probability of Israel uh, opting for a military strike against Iran? Well, first of all, I would like to say that Israel's defense forces continuously monitor the uh, the activities of Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, who are both Iranian proxy groups because they receive the support of Iran and they act on the interests of Iran in most cases. And Iran has stated openly that it wants to destroy Israel. Israel is the only country today in the UN that has another country that has said openly that it wants to destroy it. And this is a very serious threat for the state of Israel. So we daily monitor Hezbollah and Hamas, which are our neighbors next door, Hezbollah, with a, a controlling the Gaza Strip and with a high presence in the West Bank. And uh, sorry, that's Hamas and Hezbollah with a high presence in a, with a controlling the the Israeli Lebanese border. So Iran all the time is making efforts in order to help these groups attack Israel, and that's what Israel's can countering on a daily basis. Now, in, in terms of the nu- nuclear program, uh, we know that uh, currently Iran and the United States are engaging in indirect talks. On the uh, through Oman, to, through the Gulf country of Oman, uh, to try to mitigate and to try to lower the escalation. Now, Israel has been a, um, very vocal about being opposed to these talks because uh, it has shown to the UN, for example, in 2018, before the United States uh, withdrew from the nuclear accord, it showed that if the Iranian assets are unfreezed uh, and Iran promises not to enrich uranium, uh, it does it anyway in a clandestine way. So Israel believes that um, Iran uh, will continue to develop the nuclear weapon and also its ballistic capabilities, which are just as dangerous. Uh, um, And if if they unfreeze their assets, that Iran will do it this more easily, just in a clandestine way, so that that this is why Israel opposes. Now, the possibility of an attack depends on on the red lines that Israel has drawn. I'm sure that the Israeli government has drawn some red lines that if Iran passes them and a nuclear weapon in the hands of Iran is imminent, Israel will attack. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said this many times. Now, the question is if America will 
support this or not. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that if Israel has to do it alone, it will do it alone. But also the Israeli government has been very vocal in saying that it would most rather it was it would rather to do this with American support than even with America leading a coalition because at the end of the day the United States of America also doesn't want Iran to 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 get their hands on a nuclear weapon they're just trying the diplomatic channels first but I guess that if Israel makes the case that uh, the diplomat these diplomatic channels are not uh, functioning I say, I believe that America could uh, could join Israel in in whatever measures it, they think uh, have to be taken also, there are many narratives that even if Israel um, launch an airstrike against Iranian nuclear program, most of this program is under the mountain and uh, in a technical way, it will not destroy the whole program. So there are also, I think there are also some uh, obstacles on the on the te- technical way. So, uh, but in the end, I want really to thank you for the insights and uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. The pleasure was mine. Thank you so much for listening. I enjoyed all of the conversation. Thank you very much for watching and listening to us. Please don't forget to subscribe.